Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus today for episode two of four in our series on drinking water. It's kind of important, it's everywhere, and you probably don't even think about it, but we did, because this is DNews Plus. We're gonna talk about when drinking water became a thing, what were some of the first technologies to get drinking water to us, we talked about some of that yesterday. We're also gonna talk about regulations in drinking water and what is actually in there exactly. We're gonna talk about defluoridation and fluoridation, we're actually gonna talk about a lot of stuff. So stick with us, make sure you subscribe for all the episodes in this series. Let's kick into it. So what is in your water? I mean, when you think of water, you probably think of it as one thing, right? You turn the tap on or whatever it is, and then it's water. It's nice and clear. Sometimes there's little floaties in it, but for the most part, it's just water but it's not, and it never has been. We started caring about what was in our water a really, really long time ago. We mentioned some of this earlier, uh, talking about early methods of water purification. There is also things like boiling or heating under the sun. There's dipping heated iron into water to get it to boil, and there's filtration with gravel and sand. There's even things like ancient inventions and methods to help filter water, like the one Hippocrates created called Hippocrates' sleeve which just sounds dirty. Basically, it was a cloth bag that was used to strain boiled rainwater. In the 17th century, Sir Francis Bacon and others used sand as a means of filtration, which later evolved to coal filtration uh, to improve the taste and the odor of water that had been filtered through sand, which makes a lot of sense if you've ever smelled sand. So generally, everyone had kind of the right idea. We were trying to run water through different things in order to get impurities out of it. The problem is we didn't necessarily understand germ theory at this point. In 1849, drinking water was not doing so hot. Cholera epidemics were killing thousands of people, 5,000 in New Orleans, 8,000 in New York City. In 1853, nearly 10,000 people in London and Newcastle in the UK were killed. Five years later, we learned that it was due to consuming contaminated food and water. We had no idea. This helped lead the theory that germs could be spread through things like drinking water. To combat this, the city of London passed the Metropolis Water Act of 1852. The idea was to make sure all water was filtered. Reservoirs within five miles of St. Paul's Cathedral had to be covered up so that, you know, animals weren't pooping in them. In the 1890s, chlorine was found to be a good disinfectant. In 1902, Belgium was the first country to implement the use of chlorine to treat a public water supply. And by 1908, the first US water supply was chlorinated in New Jersey. And of course, once you start chlorinating water in America, people get upset because they're putting chemicals in the water. That is good. It's important to be skeptical. It's part of our American heritage. But in the courts, the city's right to chlorinate the water supply was upheld because of public safety. Thus, the typhoid rate dropped by half following the implementation of chlorination in New Jersey, and we will get into how chlorine affects drinking water exactly in just a minute. In 1914, the US Public Health Service set a maximum contaminant limit for public water, limiting the amount of bacteria that could be in a water supply. They would probably culture that bacteria and say, oh, too much in here, you gotta back it off somehow. In 1925, the Public Health Service added even more limits to limit the levels of lead, copper, zinc, and excessive soluble minerals in water. In 1962, the US Public Health Service Drinking Water Standards Revision came out saying that all public water suppliers now had to adhere to a minimum standard of water quality. By 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed and provisions for restoring and maintaining bodies of surface water in the US began, which is great because that way we can protect our lakes and rivers. It's very important. By 1974, the Safe Drinking Water Act was passed, expanding the scope of federal responsibility for the safety of our drinking water. By 1986, the Safe Drinking Water Act was amended to set mandatory deadlines of regulation for key contaminants. They required monitoring and established benchmarks and had enforcement powers that they built in. And that was when we started really grabbing the reins of this water world. Now, this is not the Kevin Costner version, by the way. Uh, this was in 1986, which actually wasn't that long ago if you think about it. I mean, if you rewind to like the 1930s and 40s when maybe your grandparents were alive or great grandparents if you're very young, uh, there were still issues with people having water that wasn't particularly safe. In 1996, President Clinton signed the Safe Drinking Water Act reauthorization, and that required all states to implement or establish a few different things. The first was some kind of monetary fund to provide communities uh, a way to improve drinking water facilities. The second was 
protecting the source of the water. Third was to make sure we had enough capacity for everyone. And then, of course, to assist public water systems in, quote, consumer confidence reporting. So being transparent about the water source, the contaminants in the water, and the health effects, if there are any of those contaminants. All that stuff is great. It makes for the government taking care of us and also making sure they're transparent about what the heck they are doing with something that is just so fundamental to our everyday existence. But after all of that list, if you're still with us, what is in that water that can make you sick in the first place? Untreated or raw water from natural sources can be polluted with all sorts of things. Some of those are bad, some of them are fine. But uh, they have different names, obviously. You know, debris is one, just junk in the water. There's minerals, which are usually things like that you could call debris, but it could be okay for you. But there are also things like sewage and bacteria, algae and fungi, parasites and chemicals. And some of these things can make you sick. I know what you're thinking. Why do these things make me sick? but my dog can go drink out of that puddle in my front yard. Well, that's because <laughs> you don't really know whether your dog is sick all the time. Animals can also get sick from water sources. Cryptosporidium is a common waterborne parasite that causes diarrhea. It infects both animals and humans. And in fact, most strains infect animals more than humans. Many animals just contract these parasites and bacteria and kind of live with it because they can't be like, my tummy hurts, you know? Just kind of live with it. And remember, just because humans don't drink from muddy puddles means that we would get sick if we drank from them. In some cases, animals are more resistant to waterborne illness since they're more exposed to it. They build up more resistances than us, but that's not always the case. I mentioned earlier that I went down to Philmont, New Mexico when I was in Scouts, and the thing that was in the water that we were trying to chlorinate and iodine against was Giardia. It's a waterborne parasite that causes diarrhea. It existed out in New Mexico in those rivers. It's a super common parasite in cattle, but their symptoms are often less severe than for humans, cats, or dogs because they're exposed to it more often. So for us, we were cool drinking iodine flavored water because it was either that or the Hershey squirts. And let me tell you, iodine doesn't taste so good, but I definitely don't want that other thing. But the good thing is we have brains which help us treat this water so that we can have it to you safely. And we've gotten really, really good at it. The water that you buy in a store usually goes through a series of filtration techniques, usually sediment filtration, getting out dirt and debris and things. Then it goes through carbon filtration where it takes out excess chlorine, chemicals, and pesticides. Then they completely purify the water sometimes using reverse osmosis, distillation, or deionization. Reverse osmosis works by passing the water through a semi-permeable membrane, essentially something that has holes so small that the water can get through, but other things can't. It's kind of like the technological version of passing it through sand, but sand has a lot bigger holes in it. Distillation is the process of converting liquid into a vapor, or essentially letting it evaporate, and then condensing it back into a liquid form. It's a really great way to make sure you just have water, because the water vapor doesn't usually carry stuff with it. Uh, deionization is a little more complicated. It requires uh, electrical stimulation of the water. Essentially, you're using something to attract any of the stuff in the water that has an electrical charge. The reason you'd want to do that is because there are ions in the water. Ions are molecules that have a positive or negative charge because of the way their electrons are balanced. So calcium, magnesium, iron, sodium, manganese, and hydrogen have positive charges. So if you put the right thing into the water, you can attract those and pull them out. Where chlorides, sulfates, nitrates, carbonates, silica, hydroxyls, those have negative charges. So if you attract those, you can pull those out. So those three different types are the ways to remove more impurities from your water. And that gets you water with no debris, no chemicals, no bacteria, no parasites, and it's very safe to drink. You may have heard some other types of things. I just mentioned iodine. Iodine kills the parasites and bacteria through oxidation. Iodine is very electronegative, so it reacts with structures, literally the structures inside of the pathogens, which causes them to oxidize. Rust is oxidizing metal, uh, iron specifically. So when it does that, it, it destroys, through a chemical process, the iron, right? This is the same kind of deal. Oxygen exposed to the pathogens kills them. Chlorine in water is a hypochlorite and hypochlorous acid. It reacts with biomolecules in the bacteria and it kills the organism. So all of this is essentially to get the bad stuff out of your water, right? But there is good stuff in there. I 
touched on it earlier, like minerals. And minerals in your water don't hurt you necessarily if they are the right ones, like copper, for example. It has antioxidant properties, iron utilization, and it's good for your cardiovascular health. Calcium and magnesium help bone and cardiovascular health, and sodium helps with our electrolyte balance. A little salt is pretty good. And on top of that, other elements can be present in your water and they can be good for you. Fluoridation is very important because it is associated with a lower incidence of dental problems such as tooth decay or cavities. We've been fluoridating our water for a long time and that is the benefit. Too much fluoride, however, because if you've already tuned out, then you don't know this, but too much fluoride is bad. Very bad. Very, very bad. But just a teeny, teeny bit like anything in chemistry, dosage. A teeny bit can be really good for you. The drawback of too much fluoride is dental fluorosis, tooth decay, erosion of the enamel, staining or pitting of teeth. And the first reports of this were in 1888 when a family from Durango, Mexico were described as having black teeth. There's also skeletal fluorosis that causes pain and damage to bones and joints. And it's primarily associated with drinking water containing elevated levels of fluoride, but can also be caused by exposure to additional sources of fluoride like high fluoride coal. So it's not always water, but it can be. But before we get too far, you're probably thinking, why don't we just drink salt water, right? Most of the water on earth is salt water. Why can't we just drink that? I mean, fish drink it, whales drink it. Why can't we? It's a great question. The obvious difference, of course, between salt water and fresh water, also known, fun fact, as sweet water, is the salinity, the sodium content, the salt content. Fresh water, lakes, rivers, streams, marshes, ponds, snow, rainwater, ice, those kind of things, those only contain a small amount of salt, those water sources. And it's true that our body does need salt. We need it to metabolize food, to use our muscles, to pump our blood. And salt water contains a lot of salt, way more than we need in our daily life. And that means when we drink something like that, our body tries to get rid of the excess salt. It does so by urination. But in order to urinate, you need water. So if you drink a lot of salt with some water, and then you try and urinate, you don't have enough water to get it out. It's bad. Our kidneys only produce urine that is slightly less salty than salt water. So we end up urinating more liquid than we actually drank. That's why salt water causes dehydration. Now, salt water isn't the only thing that will cause you to dehydrate. Snow would also do that. And that's because snow decreases your core temperature. You're sacrificing your temperature in order to take in that fluid. Your body increases the metabolic rate to keep you warm and you're exchanging high levels of energy to melt that ice and that snow and you're getting very little gain. So eating snow to drink water it should be a very last, last, last option. That's why you usually see in survival stories that people are heating the water, either using the sun or a cooking stove, not only to purify it, but also because it wouldn't be so great for you to try and melt it with your internal body heat. That stuff costs energy. It's not unlimited. D News Plus, survival tips. Just saying, maybe we should write a book about it. Anyway, tomorrow we're gonna talk to our special guest. She specializes in water defluoridation. So for all those people that are still mad that I talked about fluoridation, you can get rid of it. It's defluoridation. She studies how they do this all around the world and why it's important. So make sure you come back tomorrow to get that episode subscribed so you get that. If you wanna learn more stuff, you should check out the Great Courses Plus video learning service. With the Great Courses Plus, you can stream hundreds of lectures presented by award-winning professors. You can do this anywhere, anytime. I recommend checking out Experiencing the Hubble, Understanding the Greatest Images of the Universe. The Hubble is amazing and its pictures are great. As a DNews Plus viewer, you can actually get a free month of unlimited access just go to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash dnewsplus. Again, that's thegreatcoursesplus.com slash dnewsplus. And it also helps the show. Thanks a lot for watching. The link is in the description if you want to check that out. And let us know also while you're down there clicking around if you've ever tried to purify your own water for any reason, camping trip or anything else. Let us know and make sure you subscribe for more dnews plus. I'm Trace. Find me on Twitter at Trace Dominguez. See you tomorrow.